Well, if we're going to assume that there was some sort of beginning, some sort of uh, explosion, mm. the point, the first thing you've got to answer really is whether that continues permanently, mm. infinitely, or mm. whether it, it persisted for a while and then stopped. Yeah. And I think that the latter is the only conceivable thing you can say. Mm. And if you've got a bang, whatever kind it was, that started and then stopped, if you think about it, it's got to produce a shell, mm. with the outside edge being from the very beginning of the bang, and the trailing edge from when the bang stopped banging. Mm. So, um, if we assume that, um, how does this change what we actually see when we look at the universe? Well, it, it depends what we think exists outside of that shell universe. Mm. Um, and I think the only guess that we can make is that there's nothing there at all. Mm. That it's absolutely empty. Mm. And what we've got to say then is can light and radiation in general mm. get propagated through that emptiness? And I would say no. So uh, this relates to your theory of empty photons, doesn't it? That's right, because within the created universe uh, I'm assuming that that isn't empty, mm. that there is some sort of means by which electromagnetic radiation can be propagated. Mm. answers your question that such light could in fact be totally internally reflected mm. at the boundaries of the shell mm. because light can't leave the shell can't leave the I'm shell sorry. there's nothing nothing to propagate it outside so it'll it'll tend to do what it does when it's leaving glass and going into air mm. it'll be totally internally reflected if the angles are right this could mean that most of what we see in space may well be an illusion and things aren't where we think they are. I think that's accurate. Um, could you explain why that might be? Well, if you take one star within that thin shell mm. and think of one observer somewhere else within that thin shell, mm. you can get the light going directly from that source to the observer. Mm. But just as easily, you can get the light going from its source, mm. bouncing by totally internal reflection mm. off the boundary, and still get into that same observer. Mm. Not only that, it can go by many different routes mm. to get to that observer. So what will the observer see? Not one star or source, but many. Mm. And they will appear to be where the universe isn't. Mm. This is along the line of sight, you know, mm. they will extrapolate it out into nothingness, even though it's actually bounced mm. to get there to the observer. Um, the the shell-shaped, um, totally internally reflected universe is, is quite a, a major departure from, from what modern physicists conceive of. Um, what makes you uh, disagree with modern physicists' view of the universe? That's a big question. It is a big question. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I think is nonsense is uh, having um, wave-like radiation passing through nothingness. Mm. Now they know that this is uh, not good. So uh, uh, after the quantum revolution mm. towards the end of the 19th century, they started talking about photons. Mm which were particle-like bits of radiation. Um, now, once you've got a particle, there's nothing to stop that going through nothingness. Mm. Uh, but just like when we shoot a rocket out into space, mm. um, if you've got something that's been impelled, uh, according to Newton's first law, it'll just carry on going, mm. whatever uh, it, it uh, comes across, including nothingness. So they then started uh, trying to explain light in terms of it being particles of light. Mm. 
And in fact, there's been an oscillation between seeing light as particles and seeing light as waves for the last 400 years. Mm. And it's never really been resolved. So th this goes back to things like your double slit theory as well, doesn't it? Where wave particle duality is, is, is kind of a. It's there in the midst of it. Yeah. They, they, for instance, they, they don't only find out that, that light seems to act as particles, mm. they also find that particles seem to act like waves. Mm. And in the double slit one that I investigated, mm. they were using electrons, but getting them to interfere with themselves mm. uh, and, and give you interference patterns. So th this, this kind of, the alternative, um, view of the double slit which is in our other video it plays a big role in how this shell-shaped universe theories emerged oh yeah i mean yeah. I mean, it, the thing there's so many strands of evidence that came together in the idea of this uh, paving of uh, the space within the universe mm. by these uh, empty photons uh, that that's what made uh, that's what made it be constructed into an all-embracing theory because it mm. covered so many questions in cosmology, mm. so many questions in the, the in the quantum particle mm. duality thing, mm. uh, and they all seem to come together. Mm. It's, it certainly seems the consensus now is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory more specifically, and. Um, would it be right to say you consider this a, a philosophical cul-de-sac, which is stopping us our knowledge proceeding? Well, yeah, I'd say that and a lot more. Mm. And I'd, I'd say that uh, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory has abandoned what is essential in science. Mm. Because um, they think that the only important part of science is, is the fact that it can predict things. Mm. Whereas the other side of science is that it can explain things. Mm. And they're not done the same way at all. Mm. In fact, when a primitive man shot his bow and arrow and it did hit the deer and kill it, mm. he had predicted that that would happen mm. and it happened. Mm. But did he understand everything that was involved in all those things? No, he didn't. Mm. And so prediction isn't understanding. No, no prediction is just seeing patterns and things. Quantum theory and, is and predicated on. on prediction and statistics and, and only probabilities. That, just that. They yeah. don't do any explanation whatsoever. Mm. In fact, uh, there was an argument I used to have with my best mate who was also a scientist. And we were talking about the nucleus of an atom. Mm. And there are 12 different models for the nucleus of an atom and they're mutually contradictory. Mm. And if you talk to scientists about it, they have no qualms about having 12 mutually contradictory models. Because their answer, sorry, their works. answer is it works in yeah. this circumstance or that circumstance. Yeah. So um, you're proposing uh, in your latest work uh, a holistic approach to science rather than the pluralistic maths-led uh, approach that is currently employed by the vast majority of scientists. Um, what would uh, a holist science involve? to solve some of these problems? You asked a big question. Well, you know, that's what people want to know. <laughs> well, it, well the, the main thing is, of course, that uh, pluralistic science believes that you can analyse things, mm -hmm. uh, not only uh, things as we see them, but once we know the parts of those things, we can mm -hmm. analyse the parts too, mm -hmm. and then keep on going all the way down mm -hmm. to fundamental particles and fundamental laws. Mm -hmm. Holism says that isn't true. Mm. It says you can't do that analysis mm. because the laws are not pre-existing truths mm. but the results of reality mm. developing. Mm. So that there aren't any eternal laws in holism. Mm. Uh, laws are changing mm. as reality evolves. Mm. So it's a very different approach. And just to give you some idea of how important it is, uh, when they, when Darwin came up with the natural selection idea, mm. that was a holistic law. Mm. And when Wegener came up with his tectonic plates, so was that. Mm. So uh, th this idea of holistic science is well established, mm. but is it established on the explanation side? Mm. 
Whereas the other side of science, which is about prediction, mm. is really about mathematics and formalism and logic. And physics is pretty much tied up in that these days. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, totally.